Yeah, so my name is Ben Kester. Uh, this is something, the building a transcript of the future that I've worked on with people at uh, Michigan and uh, William Murdoch, uh, now at Harvard, was formerly at Michigan, is one of the people that worked on this with us. Um, just so you know, my biases, I'm a physicist by training, I'm new to learning analytics. This has been a great conference for me to pick up new tricks and to learn. And uh, I hope after I go through this, uh, we can all still be friends. Um, so just to lead off, so this is a typical transcript. So this is actually my transcript. So I graduated in 1998. This is fall 1994. So a transcript looks like at Michigan. So you can see up here there are subjects, courses, just quick descriptions of the course, um, a term, then a grade that I got, how that grade converts into a grade point, right? How many credit hours that is. Then over here you see what my major was, chemical engineering, and my final grade point average down here, 3.3. <coughs> 3. Um, so I remember thinking about this, you know, back at the time, geez, 3.3 is not all that great. Well, if I look back up here, you know, there's this distinction, cum laude, or cum laude, however you say it, right? Which is uh, top 20% or top 10% of GPAs in the college. Okay, great, so that's one bit of context that's in the whole transcript, right? Other than that, I got all these B's and B minuses, you know, B minus over there, B over there. And I'm thinking at the time, like, you know, that's, I was disappointed by those grades, right? But it turns out I can look in re retrospect and say, geez, the, the mean course, the mean grade for that course in 1994 was a C plus, right? No one, no one ever tells you these things, at least never told us these things, and I think don't still, people still typically don't know these things when they uh, take the courses, right? Um, so we want to improve in this situation, right? So to back up, what is a transcript? Well, it's a validated record of study. So you took courses at this university, you got a degree, you took it at this time, and it gets the official stamp of the registrar on it, right, as a, as a proof that you were here. Um, but as many have pointed out, it's an incomplete representation of the student's career. So there were some fire hose talks yesterday and some discussion from uh, Tim McKay this morning about all the other things we could include in our, uh, you know, like in, a, in an e-portfolio, for instance, or in co-curricular activities. Um, these are things that people are working on putting into data warehouses, right, and adding, could add to transcripts in the future, but they're not, they're not all quite, not all quite there yet. Um, so what I want to focus on today, or what we want to focus on today are things that are already in many of our data warehouses, right? So those are grades, the courses you took, and the people you took those courses with, right? So as I kind of alluded to earlier there, that there's minimal context in the transcript. So one of the things we wanted to explore was how could we add more context? Right, and you got a degree, so how'd you fill, fulfill the requirements for that degree? Did you take a narrow set of courses that were all focused on just your particular major, or did you spread those out across many different subjects, right? Um, and then, you know, again, it's more than grades, so with whom did you take those courses? So there's some context created by the in the classroom by the people that are in the classroom, right, not just the professor. So are those things we can add to the transcript, perhaps? Can we measure those things? And do they tell us anything new? Do they tell a different story, right? Um, this is a section about student tools, <clears throat> but I've kind of talked broadly, you know, when we present the transcript, who's the audience, we have to ask ourselves. So is it for students? Could it be for employers? Could it be for graduate student, or for, for graduate admissions, let's say? And the parts of the transcript that you present, right, as you add more things, could change, right? You could, you could pick different parts to represent yourself. So it could be a representation, it's a representation tool for the student as much as it is a permanent record. Um, so the research questions we, we're coming away then with is what content can we add from what we already have in our databases? Does it tell us anything new and consequential? And how do we present it? And that last question I'm just going to kind of push off. Um, it's kind of one of our ongoing research questions. So uh, where can we add content to the, uh, to the transcript? So again, first we're just going to use data we already have in hand. Um, one of the first things we're going to do then is acknowledge differences in grading practices, right? So this is a favorite, uh, this is a dead horse for people to beat all the time, is grade, you know, the, how deplorable grade, grading practices are. But grades are here, they're stuck with us, right? And so let's try to do something with them. So there are questions about competency-based grading versus curving. Um, so we can acknowledge and try to put grades in context, that's one place. Another place is just looking at your body of coursework. So now forgetting about the grades, did you take courses across many different subjects, or did you just take courses very narrowly focused, you know, and, and it, did you dive into disciplinary depth? Um, and of course, there are many pathways of the same degree. Um, <clears throat> and then one other thing we can look at is your, what I'll call your academic or your social network. 
So we can't tell, did you have a conversation with this person on this day? We can just say, okay, you were co-enrolled in this set of courses with these people, you know, this term and over, the, over your career, right? And that in some sense creates a context. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize is I, there, we tried a lot of different things here, right? And I only want to add things that are adding information. So if I add a new thing and it's perfect, you know, a new measurement to the transcript, then it's perfectly correlated with GPA. Right? I haven't learned anything new, right? I'm not learning anything that GPA isn't already telling me. Um, so what kind of came out of the SOL exercise were a few things that we felt like were telling us new information that we could, we could uh, tell a story with. So that kind of sets the table. So the data that we use to ask these questions and to sort of explore this topic were transcript data from the University of Michigan from fall 1998 to winter 2014. Uh, so that's about 4.3 million grades that should read, not courses for about 190,000 students. It's about 15,000 total courses in across 318 subjects. Uh, just for reference, the courses at Michigan are numbered 100, 200, 300, 400. So the 100 level courses are introductory, introductory courses, your seminars, large lectures, uh, labs. And then three and 400 level courses are you're starting to specialize in a major, right? And so these are smaller courses, more focused. Um, and grades are given on a four point scale. Um, so I'll start off you know, talking about grading practices. Uh, those are, you know, grading, grading practices and the content within the course are one place where we can begin to add context. So before I show you the next plot, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to show you so, so that you don't get mad at me and run out of the room. Um, so what you're going to see are on, one co on one column are a bunch of departments and going across the page are grades, so average grades for courses in those departments. Okay. So. <clears throat> Well, that's oranger than I had hoped. Um, so going down the right again, so let's look over here, School of Education, that's kind of the blue one at the top. What I've done is I've taken the top 10 courses in each one of these, each one of these departments, right? Highest enrollment, second highest enrollment, third highest enrollment, all the way over to 10th highest enrollment, right? So these are courses people are taking a lot in these departments. I've color coded it then by the mean grade that's handed out in that course, okay? So a wider, a uh, whiter shade means a higher mean grade, all the way down to red, which is a lower, lower mean grade, right? So the red is typically about 2.65, 2.7. That's the mean grade handed out in the course. The highest grades where it's white is typically about 3.85. So there are a few of these up here in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, right, right here. And so I've organized these, you know, as you can tell by I take the mean of the column, right, the mean grade of the column, and I put the department with the highest mean grade at the top, and then I sort, right, until I get down here to these courses down, to these departments down here. So math, <coughs> programming, and computer science, biology, electrical engineering, they give out these really low mean grades, right? And I've color coded the departments also by STEM, social science, and humanities, right? So red is STEM, blue is social science, and uh, orange is humanities. <coughs> So you can kind of see there is that the grading practices in your STEM fields are, they, they grade, they, you know, they hand out lower grades. I won't say that the courses are more difficult or not, but I can say from this that they hand out lower grades, right? And that creates a context, right? You get a GPA, you look at your transcript and you see what your grades are like, right? A lot of people don't, the students often don't know that this is the context from which those grades, in which those grades sit, okay? So that's one context that we're going to explore. The other context that we want to focus on are the classmates. So you interact with them directly, right, either through conversations or in a course or in, on an assignment or indirectly. So maybe you compete with them for grades. Maybe they just create a general atmosphere in the classroom or in a, or in a course that, you know, affect your learning in some way. Um, and depending on your pathway, <clears throat> on the major and everything that you take, you create many connections, right, different kinds of connections. So I've shown over here in this figure are numbers of classmates, right? So let's just pick one of the histograms here. So these are students. You have numbers of students on this axis, so it's number of connections, let's say, and the number, the number of students, number of classmates. So if you look at students, these are four large introductory courses at the University of Michigan. So Psych 111, Chem 210, Stats 350, and English 225. If we look at Psych 111, so now we're, what I'm showing you here are the number of students, the number of classmates that students that went through Psych 111 had throughout their whole career, right? So, so the mean 
number of students that the mean number of classmates that students like 111 had over the whole career is about 10,000, right? And it ranges from roughly for psych students between 20,000 and you know about a thousand or so. And in general, for these for these different majors here, it just kind of shows them these four majors and some of their inter, their introductory courses. They have a large number of connections, right? You're interacting with all these different people through one way or another, or even passively, but you're in a class with them. And you can see the distributions are shifted relative one another, right? Because because the, the, the courses you take, the environments that these courses are taught in are different. So in English, in our, at Michigan, for instance, they usually are taught in smaller sections, right? You don't see as many people in a large lecture as you do in a large lecture. Um, people that go through chemistry, pre-meds, they're taking a lot of large lecture classes, not just in chemistry, also in biology, probably also in calculus, right? Um, so this is a lot of opportunities to interact with students to interact with other peers, right? That's not captured in the grading distribution and it's not captured in your, uh, in your, in your uh, transcript. Um, so now to back up again, so now let's think, let's think about your performance in context, right? So I've kind of changed from the la language of grading, right? We talked about grades and, and context. I'm gonna talk about performance. So we're, get, we're gonna start to try to use grades to get different measures of performance, right? And ask if they're any good or not. So GPA, that's the weight, that's something we're all familiar with. It's your weighted average, the weighted average of your grades, right? So your grade weighted by credit hours. One thing that people have often talked about that comes up again and again in the literature, the, the example I use is Calkins et al. from 1996. It's a paper published in the NBER. Um, as I say, let's say, let's adjust your grade. And to do that, let's take your grade and subtract from it the mean grade of the class, okay? And I've called that GPAR1, so grade points above replacement. So anyone's familiar with Major League Baseball, it's kind of like wins above replacement, right? Um, it, re it resonates with some people. Um, you can do that for an individual class, and then you can compile it over a career, right? Take a weighted average with the grade points above replacement as you would with grades, right? So this is telling you, okay, if you're in a class that has really hands out really high grades, we're going to adjust for that. Or if you're in a class that hands out really low grades, we're going to adjust for that. So that's one correction, right? But what if you only took student courses with really strong students, right, your whole career? So you may be a good student yourself, and it may not matter what the, what the course grade distribution is. You're always competing against these people, and it always seems like they're better than you. You know, they're always getting better grades than you. Is that, is that telling you what you want to know? So it may be, it may not be, but we said we just assume that we want to know something different, right? We want to know how well do you do in college courses regardless of where you are. So we came up with this brute force model we call the student fixed effect. So what we do is we say each grade has a component that is you, the student, added to the mean grade of the course, right? Or what the, the course typically adds, plus some error term, right? And so to actually do this, it's a, it's a, you have to vectorize the problem. So what you end up with is a huge matrix. It's about 4 million by 190 columns. And to actually solve this, you have to, you know, there's a sparse matrix approximation you have to do, and it's a mess. Um, and I won't go into the details for that right now. But what you get out in the end for each student is a student fixed effect that's invariant over time, and a course fixed effect, which is something like the mean grade that a course gives out, right? <clears throat> and those are measured in terms of grade points, okay? So we can still talk about those in the same scale as you would with, uh, with uh, GPA. So, Let's look at that in context now. So on this axis here is cumulative GPA, and this axis is this new thing we just presented, student fixed effect. So it's centered on zero, so typically a person that's average will have a student fixed effect of zero. If they're worse, they'll be able to have a negative student fixed effect. If they're better than average, they'll have a positive. So what I did now is I said, okay, what does this tell us differently about departments? So I took students from each department that graduated with a major from the department, and I said, what are their mean cumulative GPAs? Thank you. And what are their mean student fixed effects? Okay, and I plotted them on here for each department, right? So there's a circle for each department. I labeled a few departments. You can see more of this in the paper. And you can look now, for instance, here's, here's English and here's math. So students graduating from those two departments, it's six and seven here, from those two departments, typically have about a 3.5 GPA, right? So if you're going to compare grade points for those two, to those two majors, you would, you would conclude, okay, they're pretty similar. If we look at the student fixed effect, they're actually different by about three or four tenths of a grade point, right? So the, the math students are typically, have, typically have higher student fixed effects than the English students. 
So in practice, I can go back and look at these and say, like, oh yeah, where the math students took any course at all with English students, on average, they got a higher grade, even in English class, than the English student did. Okay, so that's what that's saying in practice. So that's a quick way to adjust. It's a quick brute force way to adjust for both the course effect, right, so the course handing out different grades, and for the body, the different students you may have taken courses with across your uh, career. Um, I'm going to quickly shift gears now and move on to the things beyond grade that we talked about before. So to do this, we need a new, a new tool, this uh, diversity metric. So this is something that people use in economics, political science, biology, to look at diversity of species, markets, political, uh, political parties. There's this formula. I won't go into the details of what all that, what the, what the formula is doing, but I'll say, for instance, this index Q, this formula reduces nice and conveniently. This, is, this P of I is the proportion of the, so if we're looking at subjects, let's say, we're looking at your transcript the number of subjects you have, we can ask what's the proportion of your courses that was in this subject and then this subject and then this subject, right? When I take Q equals zero, this just reduces some simply to the total number of different subjects you took, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a fancy formula to tell you that will tell you something you already know and it'll tell you something that is maybe a little more fair, which is what people usually use in these other fields, which is pro proportion weighted by proportion, okay? So we can talk about that more, uh, more later. Um, so we're going to use that now, right, that formula. So did you take a wide, ra wide, wide range of classes, of courses, so intellectual breadth, or did you drill down in your discipline? And so from that formula before, we're going to start and say, OK, to measure that, we're going to take R to be the number of different subjects on your transcript, right? And so we're kind of, in a sense, measuring the diversity of subjects in your transcript. And then we can also ask, did your courses include peers from a wide range of of uh, disciplines, right? And in that case, we're going to look at all your peers, right, and ask what the diversity of their majors was, right? So all the peers that you took courses with. Now let's say quickly in passing, this requires a lot of network calculations that uh, Carr Epker solved uh, in brute force, um, and his work is on GitHub there for anyone that wants to use his code. Um, so I'll just quickly summarize this because I'm because I'm uh, running out of time. Um, so. We did, ran this for a cohort of students, or for uh, I think four cohorts of students in the literature, science, and uh, arts at the University of Michigan. We measured D subject, so I'm just calling the subject diversity, and D major, which is the major's diversity. And one of the things we found is that there's a mild anti-correlation with GPA for subject and no correlation with, uh, with, with a student fixed effect. And then there's no correlation of GPA or student fixed effect with D major, right? So I would say in that sense, okay, we're learning something new that we didn't already know with GPA, right? I can go down here and look and compare, look at this table and say, okay, so I can look at a particular major and say, the subject diversity of, the, of that major is 4.7 and look over here and see who, who is actually comprising the different parts of this distribution, right? So this distribution is wide, right? So there's, informa there's information on a distribution that can be probed. Um, and so one of the points to make is that the different, the different requirements of different majors kind of fix the bounds for what, for what the allowed uh, diversity is in that major for the subjects and also for, for uh, how many majors you interact with, right? So the, th so the real thing you want to do is to go into, a, with these, I think, what we're finding is that you want to go into a particular major and use these statistics <coughs> to sort individuals, to ask questions about individuals in, in majors or for a student to compare themselves to other people in their majors, right? is that it doesn't work so well to compare myself as a psych major to someone else as a physics major because the requirements fix the space, right? So these are specific examples that are in the paper that I, won't, that I don't have time to go into. Um, so what we ended with, you know, is we could add a few rows to, you know, my transcripts that tell me these new things, right? That's one step to getting to, a, you know, to building a better transcript. Another step, is to work on visualizing this. And now um, we can go into detail about way, different ways to do this, but this isn't even part of the paper, so I won't talk about it in any detail. Um, in conclusion, you know, university, university data warehouses are allowing us to flesh these out. Our, our uh, registrar at the Univers University of Michigan is really supportive of this whole exercise, right? So he's part of the process. Students are becoming part of the process. So we had these ideas, talked to students about what kind of things they wanted to see, and I think we've now started kind of a dialogue and an interchange 
with students about how to, uh, you know, what kind of things they would like to see on their transcript. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. When they graduated so uh, at Michigan they don't technically have to declare until their last term so they don't have to a lot of schools that have this trouble of, of their, their like if you did a model of what somebody's credential to major in mm -hmm. and, and what someone's declared major is they often don't match mm -hmm. for a large percentage of the students in school so uh -huh. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, we've, uh, so we've had conversations with other schools. I'm thinking of uh, Maryland was one at some point as we had a disconnect in trying to do these kind of things with our data because of our system of majors versus at Maryland and probably other places like Maryland. From day one, you were accepted to college or to, to university to pursue major X. And so I don't know how that plays out in terms of people at Michigan trying to find their path Right, and what this, what these diversity statistics look like for people that are doing that versus people that are already fixed into a fixed into a path. So I, yeah, I don't have a good sense of that. But if your distribution for who you, the major is somebody that you're in a class with, does that make a major? Right. It could be, yeah. And we, I, I don't even have a good sense of how often students in their head at Michigan decide today I'm an anthropology major, tomorrow I'm a physics major. Like, we don't have an official way of uh, recording that. I mean, they can if they want to, but we don't, we don't require it. So on other projects, like uh, on this scale, with these large universities we worked with, it seems like a lot of, you know, in general, a lot of the things are generalizable to them. Um, but for, the, for smaller schools, like that's really, I mean, it's interesting, it's a good question. So I have not conversed with many smaller schools about how applicable this is to them. Cause I certainly feel like their approach to students and their level of interaction is much different than what it is you know, this industrial state scale school. Um, I assume the student is the audience for this kind of distribution, correct? Yeah, so that's what, yeah. And have you thought about lawyers or other kind of people that, because obviously that changes the lens, um, has that come across in anything you're doing or is it pretty fixed for the students as the audience? So it's, I think we started in general, so in this whole project is just trying to look at the transcript in all different ways, right, without an, too much of an audience in mind. But I think you'll see with Gus and Chris, like there are, with the next talk, there's some discussion about what do you show students that's important to students versus what do you show to their advisors, right, that's important to advisors or to faculty that are going to teach a course. So we've thought about that, but at least my angle on that is to go as far as I can with what I have to show the student. So. So, so what's the question? The well, the question is, how can we contextualize all these grades without making a competing game between students and having it that it's not a non-zero, it's not a zero-sum game that one wins and one loses. Uh huh. I I mean I think that gets back to the whole point of grading, right? So there are people that so as soon as you start to curve a class, right, as as opposed to making it competency-based, I would say that you break you you break that symmetry, right? So I think. Anywhere where they're 
curving classes, you're already sort of creating that competition and building in this this covariance, right? So I, you know, that's just a random thought, um, but I haven't gone down that path any further to break that break away from the uh, from the uh, competition aspect. Yeah, so one of the things we uh, so we had a uh, hackathon, was it a design jam or a hackathon? Yeah, uh, a week ago. I don't know if you're going to talk about this, Chris, but we had we sat down and talked to a few students, and one of the things that, that I found interesting is they wanted to, they wanted to be credited or have it noted that they took a risk, right? So they took a risk and they failed or they didn't or they did well or they didn't, but they stepped outside of their comfort zone and tried something they wouldn't have tried otherwise, and I don't know, like you know, it's like I think about, geez, how would I detect that in the data? You know, I don't really know. I'd rather just go ask the student, but we have, you know, 20,000 students on campus. So that was one that, I don't know, that's one I'm interested in uh, pursuing, to see if we can, see if we can detect risk taking. Um, just to follow up on the question about the transcript, the, the redesign, um, currently when we talk to employers, uh, they're not really using transcripts very much. I mean, mostly academic students who go on to advanced Uh, the the part of it that is that includes grades, yes, that yeah. does. The part where I pull in majors doesn't because I had to know what they graduated right, with, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it would change if you filtered those out as an entry? Do you think that would give you meaningfully different results? I don't think so. So I think I, at Michigan, anyways, the the graduation rate is something like ninety three percent. So it's it's pretty high. So we've played different games with that, with uh, filtering out these these kind of students in many contexts, and then uh, doesn't really seem to be an issue, at least at least at Michigan. Yeah. 